Good evening, everyone. I want to do a talk now based on the 10 stages of self-realization or the 10 Zen Oxherding pictures. And these are uh, done by um, uh, using Zen to symbolize the spiritual path that we all, we all follow. And it's very interesting that, and I'm going to use some the pictures. I'm going to try and do the share screen, some pictures, some images, and some commentaries from different people. I'll put my own ideas in, in certain places too. So I hope you enjoy this and hope it works. Um, it's a bit of an experiment. It's the next stage of my initiation into, into Zoom, into the world of virtual, uh, virtual imagery. So, okay, right. So let's breathe out any tension. Let's be at peace and relaxed and calm and tranquil. I'm going to turn the light on, make the weather a bit better. Yeah, it strobes a bit. Maybe better with the light off. So, is it right? So, be without any tension, be relaxed, be at peace, be at ease, feel totally relaxed. And that's a minute of quiet. Now I'm feeling really chilled. Let's start, see if we can do this share screen. So we start from here, um, the 10 Oxfording pictures. The 10 pictures known as the Oxherding pictures or the 10 bulls are said to have originated in China in the 12th century AD. Other versions preceded these, but there were less bulls included. One or two even had the bull changing gradually from black to white, symbolizing spiritual progress. The bull is used as a symbol for the higher self, which we have lost sight of, as the images will show as I go along. The paintings I'm using here are attributed to Tensho Shuban, who lived in the 15th century in Japan. The verses and commentaries I'm using are mainly by a 12th century Chinese monk known in Japanese as Kakuan, and were translated by Paul Reps and Senzaki Nyogen, and used in the book Zen Flesh, Zen Bones. Now in the West, Alan Watts included a description of the Ten Bulls in the secret of Zen. The pictures were eventually to influence the work of the musician John Cage, particularly in his emphasis on rhythmic silence and on images of nothingness. In his song, Ballad of the Absent Mare, Leonard Cohen interprets the 10 Oxherding pictures through the eyes of a Western cowboy, a Western cowboy ballad singer. And Cat Stevens referred to them in his album Catch bull at four, surprisingly. So let's look at image one. In image one, it's called The Search for the Bull. And it's accompanied by this verse. In the pasture of this world, I endlessly push aside the tall grasses in search of the bull. Following unnamed rivers, lost upon the interpenetrating paths of distant mountains, my strength failing and my vitality exhausted, I cannot find the bull. I only hear the locusts cheering through the forest at night. On the commentary, 
by um, Kakuin, the ox has never really gone astray. So why search for it? Having turned his back on his true nature, the man cannot see it. Because of his defilements, he has lost sight of the ox. Suddenly, he finds himself confronted by a maze of crisscrossing roads. Greed for worldly, worldly gain and dread of loss spring up like scarring flames. Ideas of right and wrong dart out like daggers. So, so this symbolises that we have lost touch with our true nature and we follow many paths that lead nowhere. Our lower nature and mind prevent us from seeing the truth. As the voice of the silence tells us, the mind is the great slayer of the real. Let the disciple slay the slayer. In this confusion, we lose track of this true self and wander aimlessly. We live in fear of losing things, material possessions, family, friends, etc. And are always after some transitory material gain. Things we can't take with us when we pass on. We should store our treasures in heaven or in our inner self and not on earth. Here the word used is locust, but in most cases it is cicada, which is a similar insect and symbolises rebirth and renewal. Maybe hearing the song of the cicada refers to the fact that we are still in the realm of birth and death, samsara, and heed the song of material life. So two is discovering the footprints. Along the riverbank, under the trees, I discover footprints. Even under the fragrant grass, I see his prints. Deep in remote mountains, they are found. These traces are no more, no more can be hidden than one's nose, looking heavenward. And the commentary, understanding the teaching, I see the footprints of the bull. Then I learn that just as many utensils are made from one metal, so too are myriad entities made of the fabric of self. Unless I discriminate, how will I perceive the true from the untrue? Not yet having entered the gate, nevertheless, I have discerned the path. Discern the path. So now we begin to awaken. And in spite of the confusion caused by our senses and lower mind, we begin to discern the path in the deepest part of our nature. We have some basic idea of the oneness of all things, but as yet have not fully awakened to it. Applied to us, it is that moment we begin to become aware there is something deeper and more beautiful in us than we have thought, that we are more than just the physical. It may be some traumatic event that brings about this awakening, or we may be led to it by the wonders of nature or art or music or poetry, but something needs to awaken that divine discontent with the things of the world. The discrimination at this point is between what is true and what is illusion or delusion. At this point of our awakening, we need this discrimination. So now three, is perceiving the bull. And the verse goes, I hear the song of the nightingale. The sun is warm, the wind is mild. Willows are green along the shore. Here no bull can hide. What artist can draw that massive head, those majestic horns? So the, the commentary set goes, when one hears the voice, one can sense its source. As soon as the six senses merge, the gate is entered. Wherever one enters, one sees the head of the bull. This unity is like salt in water, like colour in dye stuff. The slightest thing is not apart from self. So, so now we begin to be aware of the oneness of all things through direct experience. We have symbolically entered the gate. The six senses have merged into the seventh, which gives us this direct perception. 
It can be equated with buddhi in theosophy, our intuitive nature. This true nature cannot be imaged. It must be felt within. The voice of the silence says, merge into one sense thy senses, if thou wouldst be secure against the fall. Tis by that sense alone, which lies concealed within the hollow of thy brain, that the steep path which leadeth to thy master may be disclosed before thy soul's dim eyes. So four now is catching the bull. And the verse says, I seize him with a terrific struggle. His great will and power are inexhaustible. He charges to the high plateau, far above the cloud mists, or in an impenetrable ravine he stands. The commentary, he dwelt in the forest a long time, but I caught him today. Infatuation for scenery interferes with his direction. Longing for sweeter grass, he wanders away. His mind still is stubborn and unbridled. If I wish him to submit, I must raise my wit. So this is Cat Stevens, Catch Bull at Four, mentioned earlier. I don't know how many people were aware that that's, um, that's what the title of the album was, what, or what it meant. So in other words, we must learn to control through study and meditation. This may be difficult at times, but as long as the mind is turbulent, it will cause us problems. Our low nature fights back, filling us with doubts, sad feelings, but we must hold on through all of this. This is symbolising by the, by the use of the whip. Symbolised by the use of the whip. It, it seems rather, rather a cruel thing to us nowadays. But it means we have to hold on. If our mind strays, bring it back to focus on this higher self. It says in the Song Celestial by Sir Edwin uh, Arnold, which is, is his version of the Bhagavad Gita. It says... But as, as often as the heart breaks, wild and, and wavering from control, so oft let him recurb it, let him rein it back to the soul's governance. For perfect bliss grows only in the bosom tranquilized, the spirit passionless, purged from offence, vowed to the infinite. He who thus vows his soul to the supreme soul, quitting sin, passes unhindered to the endless bliss of unity with Brahma. I love that expression, vowed to the infinite. Vowed to the infinite. So now we come to five, which is taming the bull. Taming the bull. And the verse says, the whip and rope are necessary, else he might stray off down some dusty road. Being well trained, he becomes naturally gentle. Then unfettered, he obeys his master. The commentary says, when one thought arises, another thought follows. When the first thought springs from enlightenment, all subsequent thoughts are true. Through delusion, one makes everything untrue. Delusion is not caused by objectivity, it is caused by subjectivity. Hold the nose ring tight and do not allow even a doubt. So this is the next stage. If you're able to pass through the last one, you'll realise that if your thoughts are turned towards enlightenment, all following thoughts will also be turned towards enlightenment and they will be in tune with that. So through continuing meditation, keep thought focused on higher things. Delusion is caused by the way we look at things, where we see things, not by those things themselves. The voice of the silence again tells us that thou hast to feel thyself all thought, and yet exile all thoughts from out thy soul. Thou hast to reach that fixity of mind which, in which no breeze, however strong, can waft an earthly thought within. Thus purified, the shrine must of all action, sound or earthly light be void. E'en as the butterfly, overtaken by the frost, falls lifeless at the threshold. So almost all earthly thoughts fall dead before the fame. So we must be truly vowed to the infinite. 
So next, riding the bull horn, number six. And the verse says, mounting the bull, slowly I return homeward. The voice of my flute intones through the evening. Measuring with hand beats the pulsating harmony, I direct the endless rhythm. Whoever hears this melody will join me. The commentary, this struggle is over. Gain and lost are assimilated. I sing the song of the village woodsman. I play the tunes of the children. I stride the bull, I observe the clouds above. Onward I go, no matter who may wish to call me back. And another, another commentary, not mine, another commentary from someone else, says, the sixth stage represents a deepening of understanding and the corresponding tendency to disengage from exhausting mental struggle. Krishna in the Bhagavad Gita makes reference to this state when he remarks to Arjuna, who dwells in his inner self and is the same in pleasure and pain, to whom gold and or stones or earth are one, and what is pleasing and displeasing leaves him in peace, who is beyond both praise and blame, and whose mind is steady and quiet, who is the same in honour and disgrace, and has the same love for enemies and for friends. It is here where we begin to move beyond duality and all the re reactive states, attraction and repulsion, and subsequent sufferings that arise from that. So from, from my few words, here our mind has become Manasa Tajasa, illumined by the light of buddhi or our intuition. We are calm and tranquil, even amidst the greatest of life's trials, because we are under the guidance of our higher self. We have found the eye of the storm, where all is peace. Our ears are attuned to the soundless sound beyond all limiting earthly noise. We hear the music of the spheres. No seven, the bull transcended. The verse says, astride the bull, I reach home. I'm serene. The bull too can rest. The dawn has come. In blissful repose, within my thatched dwelling, I've abandoned the whip and the rope. The commentary, all is one law, not two. We only make the bull a temporary subject. It is as the relation of rabbit and trap, of fish and net. It is as gold and dross, or the moon emerging from a cloud. One path of clear light travels on through endless time. One path of clear light travels on through endless time. So, not very nice comparisons anyway, not the first two anyway. Uh, a rabbit and trap, fishing net. But it means that we have gone beyond concepts, beyond the workings of the mind, beyond duality. We have overcome our illusion of separateness. We and the bull are one. The moon in Zen is a symbol of the enlightened mind. It emerges from the clouds of our conceptual thoughts and shines without any restrictions. Also the gold from dross sounds like alchemy, the refining of our nature. It's just like the Buddhist teaching of the raft. You need the raft to cross a river, but once across you leave it behind and it becomes a burden. So it is with the intellect and limiting concepts. So as I said, the last line of the commentary is very evocative. One path of clear light travels on through endless time. You could use that for a meditation. It's a beautiful, beautiful sentence. In The Light on the Path by Mabel Collins, it says, for within you is the light of the world, the only light that can be shed upon the path. If you are unable to perceive it within you, it is useless, useless to look for it elsewhere. It is beyond you, because when you reach it, you have lost yourself. It is unattainable. 
because it forever recedes. You will enter the light, but you will never touch the flame. So the next two are harder to explain in words because we're going beyond these concepts. This is number eight, both bull and self transcended. Whip, rope, person and bull, all merge in no thing, the verse says. This heaven is so vast, no message can stain it. How may a snowflake exist in a raging fire? Here are the footprints of the patriarchs. The commentary says, mediocrity is gone. Mind is clear of limitations. I seek no state of enlightenment. Neither do I remain where no enlightenment exists. Since I linger in neither condition, eyes cannot see me. If hundreds of birds strew my path with flowers, such praise would be meaningless. So even the concept of enlightenment has now gone. We're in a state beyond all. We don't care about being enlightened or not, because those ideas don't exist anymore. The circle represents perfection at a certain level, or the absolute. But in a sense, what is perfection? Perhaps just relative. A circle in Buddhism is called Enso, and represents the luminosity of mind, the Buddha nature, the heart of mercy, the great way of heaven and earth. So both bull and seeker disappear. There's no conception of either. For what we have become, there is no name. Praise is meaningless because there is nothing to praise anymore as there is no thing. The Diamond Sutra states, if one thinks they are a bodhisattva or an adept, then they are not truly one because they are still clinging to concepts. There are still traces of the idea of a personal self in them. But many have gone before. Their footsteps are there to lead us on. So we come to number nine, reaching the source. Too many steps have been taken returning to the root and the source. Better to have been blind and deaf from the beginning. Dwelling in one's true abode, unconcerned with that without, the river flows tranquilly on and the flowers are red. The commentary says, from the beginning, truth is clear. Poised in silence, I observe the forms of integration and disintegration. One who is not attached to form need not be reformed. The water is emerald, the mountain is indigo, and I see that which is creating and that which is destroying. So in this state, one is able to observe calmly the rising and falling of the tides of life. Everything is as it should be. It's like the Zen saying that when one sets off on the journey, one sees a mountain as a mountain. Then one realises it is not a mountain, but at a higher state, it becomes a mountain again, because the habit of intellectualising and conceptualising has passed. We can see in this picture that everything is as it should be. We have gone beyond seeing and hearing in the conventional sense. So we are in a way blind and deaf, but only in the same way we talk about darkness in regard to things beyond our perceptions. All was darkness before the universe came into being. So the final one, number 10, is in the world. And the, and the verse says, barefoot and naked of breast, I mingle with the people of the world. My clothes are ragged and dust laden, and I am ever blissful. I use no magic to extend my life. Now before me, the dead trees become alive. And the commentary says, inside my gate, a thousand sages do not own me. The beauty of my garden is invisible. Why should one search for the footprints of the patriarchs? I go to the marketplace with my wine bottle 
and return home with my staff. I visit the wine shop in, on the market and everyone I look upon becomes enlightened. So this is now the stage of the Bodhisattva who voluntarily returns to the world to help others. He freely mingles with all people to try to help them to realize their true nature. In Buddhist teaching, a Bodhisattva uses expedient means to teach others. He will take on an appropriate form or use appropriate language that can be understood by those he is trying to communicate with. Jesus did the same with his parables, etc. At this stage, no special powers are needed. The very aura of the Bodhisattva is enough to heal on all levels. Remember the woman who touched the hem of Jesus' robe and was healed just by that? He does not need sages to guide him anymore. He is beyond that too. Dust usually refers in Buddhism to worldly sensation, suggesting that he has voluntarily placed himself in these sensations to be able to help the dead trees come alive. And the dead trees becoming alive refers to two things. One, there's a Chan Zen saying, the flower blossoms on the withered branch. It means that when our negativities have completely withered, then our Buddha nature blossoms. And two, it is the activity of the enlightened person to awaken the unenlightened. So this figure has the name Ho Tai in China. In the book Zen Flesh, Zen Bones, it is said regarding Ho Tai, anyone walking about Chinatowns in America will observe statues of a stout fellow carrying a linen sack. Chinese merchants call him Happy Chinaman or Laughing Buddha. This Ho Tai lived in the Tang Dynasty. He had no desire to call himself a Zen master or to gather many disciples about him. Instead, he walked the streets with a big sack into which he would put gifts of candy, fruit or doughnuts. These he would give to children who gathered around him in play. He established a kindergarten of the streets. Whenever he met a Zen devotee, he would extend his hand and say, give me one penny. And if anyone asked him to return to a temple to teach others, he would, he, would, he would reply, give me one penny. Once as he was about his play, play work, another Zen master happened along and inquired, what is the significance of Zen? Otai immediately plopped his sack down on the ground in silent answer, then asked the, the other, what is the actualization of Zen? At once, the happy Chinaman swung the sack over his shoulder and continued on his way. So in the picture, he has a gourd filled with wine, the wine of spiritual wisdom, and he is presenting it to a traveller, a pilgrim on the path to perhaps. The actualization of Zen is in compassionate action, not just in talking about Zen or meditation even. The same can be applied to theosophy or any genuine spiritual practice. H.P. Blavatsky always emphasized the need for practice and said theosophist is as theosophist does. So there we have the Zen, the Zen, um, uh, the Zen uh, pictures, the Zen Oxfording pictures. I hope you enjoyed that. I hope it uh, it comes out well. This because it's just a, it's just um, something I'm trying out for the first time. I was trying something new, and. Uh, <sighs> I remember the, the book, the Zen Flesh, Zen Bones, I picked, it up, I picked it up first in the 1970s and probably had several copies since then. It's always been one of my favourite books. There's some really nice stuff in it. And um, as you can see from, from these pictures, they're very spiritual and very theosophical in the, in the nature. So once again, thank you. Let's have a breathe out and just let us, a few moments of quiet.
Om Shanti, 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 peace, peace, peace. Peace on earth and goodwill to all beings. I hope you enjoyed. See you soon.